This is CHSR 97.9 FM here in Fredericton, New Brunswick, Canada. This is Python's Paradise, your film and music show. And folks, this is your host, Greg Gilbert, a.k.a. the Python Hyena. And you know, folks, uh, there's a lot of unique movies out there, you know. I mean, you know, I thought that it couldn't get any more stranger than Attack of the Killer Tomatoes. But I don't know. The guest I got on the phone tonight has a movie title that kind of ranks right up there. I'm talking about a little movie called Pro Wrestlers vs. Zombies. <laughs> Forget about The wake, the Walking Dead. That just sounds so much more exciting. And I have the director of the film on the phone with me this evening. How do you do, Cody Knox? How are you, Greg? I'm doing fantastic. Um, I was going to say, um, I had not heard of your movie until last, or just this past May, because I, I had Colt and Ariel Toombs, Rowdy Roddy Piper's son and daughter, on the phone uh, to do a tribute interview for him, because I was always a huge Piper fan, and it was so cool that they came on, and, and as I was looking at some of the films I wanted to run by them, uh, I noticed uh, Pro Wrestlers vs. Zombies, and I was like, what is this? And <laughs> I, I guess uh, uh, Piper's kids loved the movie. <laughs> they, they thought it was a blast. <laughs> you know, it was a lot of fun because Roddy was playing Roddy. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and when we actually first contacted him, it was neat because he knew he was going to play himself, but he viewed Roddy Piper as a character that he plays on screen. And then there's, there's Roderick Toombs, and then there's Roddy Piper. Mm -hmm. And he viewed them as separate people. And it, he actually said to us, he said, I am mortal, but Roddy Piper's eternal. And in light of his passing, it, it, it's interesting because how his films and the things he did are still continuing. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, um, all I tell you, you got two thumbs up from Colt and from Air Hill. They both, they both love the movie. <laughs> I, I, I was just telling, I was telling Shane Douglas that tonight. Uh, Shane and I are really close. Uh, he is in the film, obviously. Yeah. And he was in my wedding, um, so we went to college together. I didn't know him then, um, but that, that's probably how the film came about was through Shane. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, yeah, I guess. First off, to backtrack a little bit, I, I'd like to get a little bit of your background and how you got into to movie making. Uh, I used to be a newspaper reporter and nearly ended up losing my life and because I was involved in politics and tried to make changes in my local community, help three men get out of uh, convictions of murder that were falsely charged. Mm -hmm. and in the process, it destroyed my marriage. It destroyed my life. And I needed to do what I had always denied I wanted to do, which was make films. And so I decided, what the heck? Let's go for it. And it's worked out pretty well. I mean, we've made, I've directed three films, produced four films, um, and we're about to do another one on the Kicksburg UFO. That's, that's really exciting. Yeah, we're going to talk about that momentarily because one of the people, cast members you got in the one you're currently working on, I've had on my show. So. <laughs> but uh, anyway, uh, how did you get the idea of Pro Wrestlers vs. Zombies? I mean, you, the, the title itself just kind of br brings a grin to your face. Well, I, at the time, my son was uh, 14 years old, my oldest son. I have mm -hmm. two boys. And... He liked wrestling. He liked zombies. And I said, why doesn't someone put these together? And I always thought it would be really cool to see wrestling moves performed on the undead. If somebody <laughs> had to engage them that wasn't shooting them, I got tired of watching people shoot them and do all this. So I thought, what happens if someone does a body slam? What happens if they do the Dudley uh, drop? What if they uh, put them into a tombstone? And so that's what led to us pushing for the film, um, and you know, we met with Shane Douglas, and then from there it just took off. Doesn't The Undertaker count as the undead? <laughs> yeah, 
I mean, it, it's you know, we got it was so many weird issues because you had to, you know, nobody was active at the time with WWE other than Hackstall being one of their legends and Roddy being a legend. Mm -hmm. So we had to work within who was indie at that moment or who was TNA because TNA was fine with us. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's how we got Kurt Angle as a cameo and Matt Hardy. And uh, Axel was on the Legends contract, so he could do whatever he wanted, and so was Rod. Um, and then Shane, everybody's mad at Shane, so Shane's always like a free agent. <laughs> it's just kind of a given. <laughs> you know, I'm surprised the WWE did not do more with Shane Douglas, because it's like, I just remember he was in one Royal Rumble, and then he just kind of disappeared. And it's like, you know, people in the wrestling know who he is. It's like, uh, you know, he should at least be in one WrestleMania. It's like, well, like what well, happened? Well, the pro yeah, the problem is that Shane is really bright. Mm -hmm. And he's, he's business savvy. And he knows when Vince is giving him a raw deal. And he also doesn't have the, I love the man, but he has no filter. <laughs> he knows exactly what he thinks. And he will call Vince on his shit. And none of this goes over well with Vince. Um, so, you know, the funny part is he's an amazing actor. Mm -hmm. He is nothing in person like the character he portrays. You know, a lot of these guys are, Hacksaw is exact. There's a reason why they, they only had Hacksaw make a heel turn once. Because he is a dream of a human being. A man that I feel blessed have gotten to know because I was a kid who watched him walk in to fight the Iron Sheik, which <laughs> led to the, the, the I mean, Hacks, people forget Hacksaw helped put that over when Hulk Hogan goes in because Hack's the guy who gets beat first. Yeah. As part of that build up, Iron Sheik's beating all these people, and here comes Hack with his American flag and his two by four, and he's going to fight for America, and the Iron Sheik beats the hell out of him. And that sets up, there's only one guy left at that time in the WWF, and that's Hulk Hogan. And he's the only guy who can beat the Iron Sheik. And it was it was done masterfully. Did you ever think about getting, I was going to say, did you ever think about getting the Iron Sheik in your movie? <laughs> he's got like a whole second personality with the Howard Stern show. He, he has. We, we had all kinds of guys we got to talk to in the build-up. Uh, we talked to Larry Zabisco. Oh, great guy. Uh, the, original, the original script had uh, Bruno written into it. I love Bruno. Um, oh, Bruno's. I mean, we, we're having a really sad day down here because Dominic Danucci's wife died uh, yesterday. Um, and uh, actually, uh, Shane and I were discussing it. And he's there. Him and Cody Michaels are trying to help Dom. And I, I, I really like Dom. Mm -hmm. he, he's a good guy. Uh and, and, you know, I grew up idolizing these guys. Mm, yeah, and same here. To get to work in a film with them was a dream. It, it's, it's actually kind of, I go back to my class reunion, and it's like, you know, I worked with Roddy Piper. I got to work with uh, Hacksaw. And I mean, we traveled with Hack uh, promoting the film. We were, you know, we went down to North Carolina and met with Matt Hardy. And then Matt was down in New Orleans when we were promoting and, you know, I mean, we, it, it's just neat. I mean, Matt just had, he has two children, and one of them is one year older than my son and my youngest, and, and a year, the other one's a year behind. And, you know, where I'm watching their kids grow up. Uh, you know, we, we follow the stuff because we know him and Revy. Mm -hmm. And it's neat to see them building a family. Uh, you know, and Hack's kids are going off to college. And for it to be that you can go to Wrestle, WrestleCon, for example, and you walk in, and they see you, and go, "Hey, Cody, come over here." It's just, it's just surreal, um, and you know them as, as human beings because uh, they are. And I don't, I think sometimes people forget that. You know, they, they they post stuff and are angry at them, and yeah. we all make mistakes. I mean, their life is full of pressure. Do you and, ever do you ever see Lonely Virgil at the WrestleCon? <laughs> yes, I, I, I Virgil, <laughs> you know. We talked about having Virgil in the film, but he is. And the funny part is, is he has an ego that's a, as big as the house. I mean, and, and 
I don't want to say it just he. It seemed like it would be difficult to have him in the film. Um, but you know, he he everything's about the money. Yeah. Where with Roddy, it was about what we were going to do for the film and how we're going to make a good film. You know, he knew that it does. I can get paid, but I do better if the film does better. You know, he had been through that process. Why um, couldn't Why couldn't you sign Bruno and Larry? Uh, we decided Larry was all in. There was no issues. It was just a decision of we have this much money and who are we going to, to focus on. So Larry was part of the early discussions, and then um, we decided that, hey, Hacksaw's available. And I guess for me, Hacksaw was somebody I always wanted to work with. Okay. Um, I mean, in the early scripts, and in Bruno, um, it, it was how much could he still do? Nothing against him physically. He is a monster of a man. Yeah. But it was, you know, you got into what would work out versus the cost because he would have been a really expensive. But he had just made the deal with Vince where he came back and it was like a million dollars or something up paid. And budget-wise, we didn't think we could afford Bruno. Um, you know, he's very protective of his brand and, and for good reason. And, I th- and so I view him in, uh, it's just almost it's a separate class from everybody else as a wrestler. So we never got, we never even got to the point of talking to Bruno about it. It was a discussion. Shane could have presented it and we just decided, so when he turned us down, we just decided this isn't going to work for him. I think he's uh, the greatest he, champion they've ever had. I just, I have tremendous respect for Bruno. And in and, and Pittsburgh, we all adore him. And so, you know, I, I think I should say it's more out of respect, you know, that it didn't fit his brand. Um, we did, for a long time, Terry Funk was supposed to be part of the film, but then we got into the SAG issues, and and, and we couldn't do it SAG. Love Terry. Terry. And we, we had all this stuff where he said, Funk you, and he kills the zombies, and then he gets <laughs> killed, because they're all playing themselves. Yeah. So you get to see Matt Hardy killed. If you dislike Matt Hardy... <laughs> You know who I dislike? There you go. You know who I dislike? I absolutely despise Shawn Michaels. He took our con- he took our I would have loved to see Shawn Michaels killed by a zombie. I he, he well during the micro before the Montreal screw job, he took our Canadian flag and he desecrated on it. And uh wow. yeah, he rubbed it on his crotch, he spit on it. I wish the fans had a stormed the ring and beat the shit out of him because I think Shawn Michaels is just, he's garbage is what he is. He's, he's, and this whole, I lost my smile. He's just, I, I, I can't, I do not like him. I, I think he's had everything handed right to him. I never liked him. Yeah, I've never met him, but my impression as a fan is that, um, you know, so there's, there's people that I, I really wish that I got to work with Terry Funk. Terry Funk was involved from day one with the script. Love the Terry. Written. Actually, the role that Hacksaw had mm-hmm. was originally written for Funk. But the problem we had, when you have people playing themselves, it's not like you wrote a role and they're acting. You have to completely change every line and everything you have done because now it's Hacksaw for two by four. Mm-hmm. And, you know, the conversations have to be what they are. And we, we had... And it was such a strange cast because we had Taya Parker, the penthouse pet, and we had Thomas Rodman, who does the Dennis Rodman impersonation stuff that was in ECW, and Fassad, who was an independent wrestler, who we originally had someone else, and we ended up bringing Fassad in to add this neon ninja thing. Um, and uh, I'm trying to think, the other one was Greg Grove, whose stage name is Matthew Rush, which we got all kinds of weird press. Actually, in Calgary, they ran a story because he's like the Babe Ruth of gay porn. Okay. He wanted to do a, a non-porn movie, and so we had this porn star playing himself becoming a wrestler. Okay. <laughs> and he does the, he does the uh, gorilla press with a zombie. Oh, yeah, the way he bri- rips him in half over his head? Yeah. <laughs> yeah that, that guy is a superstar in the world of gay porn. And I'll tell you a funny story. When we showed the film in Germany and England and all these different places, every time there was a show, 
somebody would come up. They'd never approach me. They approached my wife. We were engaged at the time. This was my fiance. But they would come up to her, and they would go, how did you ever afford Matthew Rush? How did you get him to do this? Wow. And because it was somebody who was a fan, who's obviously you know, a, a, a fan of his other works, and, <laughs> and, and they would come up because they were excited. And that was, I mean, from a business plan, that was part of it. I mean, like, we're appealing to a different market that normally doesn't uh, watch this type of stuff. But, and he really wanted to do non, a, a, a real film or something different in a comedy. And he was wonderful. Yes. I would hire any director in the world should hire him if they need a big, strong man. And that, I mean, he's ripped and, but such a pleasant person to work with. Um, you know, there was, it was always crazy on this set. We only got the film for 13 days and we were doing stunts, which it should have been for like six weeks instead of two. Uh, but, you know, and, and Shane, Shane designed all of the routines and choreographed them except for Kurt Angles and Kurt did his own. Yeah. Uh, and Roddy did a little bit of the stuff at the end, but it was mainly Shane directing how they would look in the fight scenes. Here's another guy. Like, I think it would have been great if you got Terry Funk. I mean, that guy's just a daredevil. There's nothing he won't do, you know? But I was wondering, yeah. did you ever... Could, we, we, yeah? We really wanted the ECW guys. I mean, because the, the, the hardcore stuff, and, you know, I, I, we should have had a zombie set on fire or something. That actually, that was in a script, too. In one of the original scripts, we had a catch-on-fire scene where they, catch, they, they burned some zombies. There's nobody and, more hardcore than Terry Funk. Yeah, he wanted to have uh, two by fours with barbed wire and smashed them into zombies. Yeah, I mean he had some really like he he wanted to do this, and it was just if we had done it sag, it would have drove the cost through the roof. Yeah, um, and, and we just didn't have the money. I mean it was, uh, you know, most of the money went to the wrestlers, uh, and and I mean I got paid well. They got paid well. You know, there was some, I, I think, production. We didn't have enough money on the production side. But, you know, West Virginia was really uh, accommodating and excited to be for us to be there. And the, the local people treat us like gold. Wow. Here's a and, few. And you know about the plot scene, right? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Uh, Shane Douglas accidentally kills somebody in the ring, and it's the brother of this guy that uh, decides to... Get revenge by raising some zombies from the grave. Well, what I was referred to though was there's a scene where Roddy Piper beats a zombie up with a, a pot in the kitchen. Yeah. And, and a in real life, he hit the guy. Oh, He okay. didn't mean to. He didn't mean to. He was supposed to be hitting the side of this one of those big steel uh, sinks. And he's hitting the side, and... He thinks he's hitting the side, and the guy has a bandaged head as a zombie, and he actually is hitting the guy in the head and bends the pot around his head. And this guy is a, rest, a, a local indie wrestler, Brandon Graver. He never moves. He gets up, and I go, Brandon, that looks like real blood. And he goes, yeah, Roddy hit me in the head, but he knew the, the main pain in the scene. He just went through with it. So then we had to send him to the hospital, and he got taken care of they brought over EMTs and checked him out and he had some stitches and Roddy gave him the pot that he bent on his head <laughs> he bent this thing right around <laughs> and, and so that that was one of the cool things that happened and then the coconuts oh um, uh, yeah <laughs> a reference to of course the Piper's Pits episode with Jimmy Superfly Snucka <laughs> and, and so I mean they, they had um, and in one of the original scripts we had written, Snook in there, and I, I got to meet him before he passed away. I was down at Miami Comic Con, and, and you know, uh, that was really neat because I grew up watching him also. Um, but they, you know, I got to meet Ron Simmons. We didn't have him in the film. It, there's some really, it's been quite an experience because to, to have watched the guys and seen them. Uh, um, but, I mean, I'm sure you have some crazy questions about what was the most craziest stuff. Or... Well, I have a few other wrestlers to ask you about. Do you ever consider Jake the Snake Roberts? 
we we did. In fact, um, imagine him. Imagine him DDTing a zombie. <laughs> <laughs> well, he was he was one of the backup ideas if Roddy hadn't agreed to do it, okay. and you know the, there was a lot of discussion because he's he has that same feel. You yeah. know, he knows how to deliver, and you can just and you have to let the guys go. I mean, they're playing themselves, so go do be yourself. You know, there, there was lines written and an idea of what's going on in the script. Uh, you know, the one person other than Shane that was always in the script was Matt Hardy. Okay. Matt was signed on very early, and we knew what Matt was going to do in the film. Uh, we the reason we ended up with Dennis or T- Thomas Robbins because we wanted Dennis Robbins. Okay. We had really wanted Dennis to be part of this also, and that would have been a lot of fun. Gilbert, like Gilbert, uh, Gallagher, Gallagher contacted us and his agent and wanted him to be part of the film. And I said, "What would we put Gallagher? What are we going to do with Gallagher? <laughs> we should have done it." You know, it would have been fun because he wanted to smash zombies. That would have been kind of fun. In hindsight, should have done it. But I really wanted to focus on the wrestlers. Uh, you know, and and that was that was always the business plan side. Was well, we went through all kinds of changes. I mean, the original script they're in the woods, and then they ended up in a prison. It was always changing, and even changed when we were on set because we only had Matt for two days instead of three. And we had a scene that wasn't working, and we just cut it. And so just there was some weather issues, and he couldn't get in mm-hmm. on time, and we just had to keep shooting. Yeah, some other was, great talents, too, like Ricky the Dragon Steamboat, terrific wrestler. Um, yes, Ricky. I don't know how, how well he'd have done in a, a film like this, but to give him one of the best, uh, Bret Hart, of course, one of the best, and, of course, the oh, nature boy Brett would have been amazing. Yeah. Amazing. Uh, that, that would have been, I mean, there's so many places you can go with it. And, you know, we've played around with, a a, a, you know, them fighting the undead. Roddy always wanted us to do a film with the wrestlers fighting werewolves. Okay. And that would have, you know, and I've, I've written a script for it. We wrote a script with him in it. Actually we wrote it with him and Colt. Okay. And, I was going to present it to them, and then he passed away. Oh. And it just was like, you know, there, there's, uh, we had someone that was really interested in producing that, and because he wanted to fight werewolves, and <laughs> that would have been fun. And we were going to use uh, Kevin uh, Sullivan. Okay. And uh, well, Kevin appears ever so briefly in pro wrestlers in one frame. Okay. He's there in a ring, uh, and I wish we would have gotten more use out of him. Uh, so Cal Val appears in the opening of the film and you know I originally we wanted her to have a bigger role and hadn't pulled that off when we went to filming so you know that, that was because uh, I'm, I'm a big fan of hers I love redheads it's, which it's who are you talking about so Cal Val from TNA oh okay I, I we have her as a ring announcer in the opening of the film, but but we had wanted her to have more of a role. Um, you know, we did get her in the film. Uh, so, but Kevin Kevin would have made a great villain. You know, in hindsight, that would have been a, a cool way to go. He likes being a villain. Another and interesting I didn't know guy. Kevin at the time, I, yeah. We like that he appears in one frame, but I got to know him afterwards and him joe laranitis i would love to do something with joe another interesting so guy too would have been rick flair <laughs> it would be hard to have rick flair and shane in the room together um <laughs> they, they, they have real heat it's not fake it's real they do not get along um though you know with rick's recent problems shane has been nothing but gracious because okay. they've all been part of a brotherhood, and and he understands that as you get older. Um, but you know that there was, uh, you know, you quickly learned. We talked at one point. We even talked. We can raise more money to have Hulk Hogan, and nobody wanted Hulk. Um, <laughs> we had wrestlers that said, "If he's here, I won't be here." You know, I don't know what their different issues were, but it was, you know, they, uh, you know, but that's. You know, obviously he has 
real star power. And you know, mm-hmm. when you're looking at the business side of things, you go, I mean, everybody loves The Rock. You know, we have people say, hey, you could raise millions of dollars and have The Rock. Yeah, that would be a dream. Um, How about Mick Foley? Mick Foley we talked about. Roddy's part was actually originally written for Mick. And it was it, – I mean, it, 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 the first versions of the script had Mick Foley and, and Terry Funk. Oh, wow. Um, and, and it had them together. And I can't remember what happened. And we found out Roddy was available. And I'm, I was a huge fanboy of Roddy's. You Roddy's. know what? I agree with you. <laughs> and I, I, went, I went with Roddy. And it wasn't that, you know, we went in and Shane is really close with Mick. And we just didn't even pursue that after that. Because once we had Roddy, we went, we can only afford one of them. And this is the guy. And, and we wanted it to be a Roddy Piper fest. You know, like he's going to be this, that, you know, it's always going to be him and Shane. And, you know, because I knew Shane better than other people to write his character, you know? And so, you know, Shane's the center point, plus Shane being an asshole and doing a hill turn in the film and all that is pretty much who he plays. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, people either love him or hate him, but they mostly hate him. And that was the point. (laughs) <laughs> you know he, he understood I'm a heel um, and, and Roddy I mean the funny part is Roddy was mainly a heel in his career but he was so good at it that people liked it yeah. and people forget that that like he was probably the best heel that, that WWE ever had yep so yeah but uh and of course, there's a number of uh, female wrestlers too. You know, like, um, like what would it have been like if you had somebody like Beth Phoenix in this film or Lita? That would have been really cool. Lita would have been fun with Matt Hardy there, um, <laughs> and with his current wife. That that would have been a lot of fun because uh, Revy Revy is uh, tough, and you know that she she. So she doesn't let anybody hurt Matt. Well, let's talk. Good thing. Let's talk about the people you did get in this film, though, because I got to tell you, okay. you got you got some really interesting people in this movie. Of course, I agree with you, Rowdy Roddy Piper, like yourself, a huge fan. I, I out of all these celebrities that have passed away over the last few years, I think it was Roddy Piper that uh, brought me closest to tears when he passed away. And uh, well, I, I I cried that day because right before it hit TMZ, my wife and I were having I can remember where I was at. We were having Chinese mm-hmm. in the town we live in, and uh, Cody Michaels, his real name is Mark Keenan, calls me and says Roddy Piper died. And I said, Are you? you know, doing a kayfabe, like, I mean, because they, these guys do this stuff all the time. You never know. He says, I never joke about a dad. And I looked at my wife and I cried. And then she started to cry. And I, I mean, still, they, they were at our house. I mean, Roddy was here when they do the commentary on the one, there's two versions of the film. They're both the same, but there's different commentary on the two different discs. Okay. And Roddy Piper, Matt Hardy, Rebby, uh, Hacksaw, Shane, uh, they were, and, and Hacksaw's wife was here also. They were here and sat in my living room of my home in Uniontown, PA, and did the commentary and watched the film for the first time. So, I mean, I, the where I sit is where Roddy sat that day. Oh, wow. Picture him there. And it was just, you know, not everything was peaches and cream when you're making a film. And he, he was very smart and and kept the production. He knew that the film had to work. Um, so sometimes he could be difficult, but it was very, very sad. And because there was, there's, there was a human being who's been hurt by a lot of people. And when we look at the success and we forget this is a human being who has done everything to protect his family from the things people have done to him. And 
I hope that before he passed away, he found the answers and all those things because he wanted to. Yeah. You know, that's, uh, um, you know, where I think that's the reason he, when he did the, the Legends House and became so close to Hacksaw, Hacksaw is a truly deeply devout Christian man. Okay, yep, and I same think here. That that, I think that appealed to Roddy, that he saw this calm and that that he needed in his life, and that Hacksaw brings that or brought that to him. And, you know, I remember I, I was just newly married, and my wife and I were fighting, and I was in Miami, and Hacksaw said to me, you know, you know, coming off a divorce and, you know, there's so much stress when you're promoting a film. Yeah. And he said to me, you know, look, I've been on the road many years and I want you to know you put your wife first because anything you could go out there and do, she could be doing at home. And he said, I've never forgot that. And that's how I remember to put Deborah first. And I went, you know what? It was so important for me to hear that because my wife and I were having this huge argument over stupid stuff. Yeah. And, you know, so that, and if you would have seen, we got to go and perform, show the film for the 28th, uh, it's not, not the 28th Infantry anymore, but at Fort Indian Town Gap, the United States Army. Okay. And we took Hacksaw and Shane there. And Hacksaw got to get up in a Black Hawk helicopter, and he was like a kid. He was exhausted from the travel, but yet the the smile on his face because it means so much what these guys do in the military. Yeah. Um, so, but you know, Roddy and him were special, absolutely special. And that's not to denigrate anybody else was there, but you know, when I look back, the memories of them, um, are big. Now talk about the other guys, Matt Hardy. I'm going to say something about Matt Hardy that people don't realize Matt Hardy can act. You don't see it in our film, but we have a scene we cut because the lighting was wrong. Yeah. He can act, and I think that he, somebody should cast him in something where he's actually in a position to perform. Um, he's a much brighter man than you realize, and I think he does a wonderful job of hiding it. And, I mean, Remy pushes him pretty hard, mm -hmm. and she's very protective of him, but she pushes him uh to to go further and i and, you know i'm happy he's back with wwe so he was and you know we get to have him with the stronger than death shirt and fighting zombies which is kind of fun um i think it's funny that <laughs> and <I'm> so, I, <laughs> the fate of matt hardy and how you see you guys shot that <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm like I, I was looking at my brother i said of all the people the zombies gonna get of course they're gonna get matt <laughs> well in the whole thing people said oh he, he he jumps from everywhere and you have him just make a short fall and he hurts his ankle well that was a joke that yep. was the point. I mean, it's making fun of the fact that he does his big... And what happens when it really matters? He hurts his ankle on on no drop at all. Um, so, he, yeah, he was he was fun to work with. His big fight sequence is really cool. Uh, we had, um, obviously, Hacksaw killing him with the two-by-fours. Kurt Angle with the ankle lock. Oh, he and, rips the foot right off the zombie. <laughs> yeah. And that was his idea. He came in and said, this is what I want to do. And we said, Kurt, whatever you want to do. Now, what neat was we were using indie wrestlers as zombies. Mm -hmm. The problem was these guys don't move at the speed that guys do at the WWF or WWE. And Kurt was constantly having to tell them, come at me faster. Don't be timid. And there was a lot of work that went in for that sequence that it was actually, it went over time for us because, and Kurt wanted it right, but he was having to, if you watch it really close, you can see that they're still a little hesitant. Now the one guy that he rips the ankle off is perfect because he was the most experienced wrestler. Uh, he had appeared for a couple shows at WWE. Mm -hmm. He moved at that speed. So we had him do it. But like when he does the, 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 uh, the forearms and knocks them over, um, those guys, 
I love them to death. They're great guys, but they and they it's the greatest moment of them for their wrestling. But they were a little slow in getting there. Um, and Kurt had to tell them come faster. You know, this has to look right. Uh, so he and he was such a professional. Kept demanding, do it right, do it right. Um, and and I would work with Kurt Angle any day. In fact, we're hoping that he's uh, going to be part of the Chexford film as a as a uh, Secret Service agent. Shane's going to be in that film. Um, and obviously, I've talked a lot about Shane, and 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 he's one of the main villains. Um, I'm trying to think of who else that was part of the main cast. Well, you had a couple of uh, lovely ladies. One, of course, we, we uh, <laughs> one of which uh, had a nasty experience with her heart. <laughs> oh, which which one's that? The one that was uh, tied up and uh, reached in. Oh, Leon! Yes, yes. Yeah. That's really interesting because we had someone cast through that role. They went through all the training with Shane, and they get there, and then they just quit on us. And I have this girl standing there who's is working as a production assistant is from Parkersburg. And I say to Leon, I think the outfit will fit you. Do you want to do it? And she has to be taught what to do with that, with the, the, the Dudley drop and all that. Mm-hmm. Shane teaches her. That's the first time she ever did in her life. Okay. And she, none of that stuff did she know how to do. And Shane would go, okay, here's what you're going to do. Here's you're going to put your feet. This is what you're going to do. And she just went for it. Okay. And, so she was a lot of fun, and we call her. She's named Barbara after the girl in Night of the Living Dead. Okay. Um, so we had her. And we actually have two women to get their hearts cut out and eaten. Uh, <laughs> the other one was a, a woman owns a bar up here that we we had cast to do that. But Le- Leon did a great job, and then she's in the big fight sequence at the end, and they do the monkey rolls and all that. Because um, the the one lady that the other one gets her heart eaten, uh, Malia. Uh, she was so happy about learning how to do a monkey roll at like 50 years old. She's a nurse. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, she, she kept telling people, I did a monkey roll. I did a monkey roll. You know, I was like, yeah, you did. Um, you know, so we, we had some really neat people and then Shane's family gets eaten, um, <sighs> which was fun. And, you know, Cody Michaels plays his brother. We thought it was fun to have his brother be named Troy Martin, or Tro- <laughs> Troy, after his real name. Okay. And, that's, that's, and those two are like brothers to each other. They went to Bethany College also. There's a lot of people from Bethany College, West Virginia, that are in the film because, you know, Shane and I went there. Cody Michaels went there. Um, I make a joke that what I got for all the years of, for the $80,000 I paid to Bethany College was contacts and pro wrestling. Yeah. <laughs> Not, not what most people go to college for, but, uh, you know, and Facade is incredible. The stuff he does when he does the backflip behind the zombie and runs up the wall. Yeah. He, he did some really neat stunts because there's nothing there. We had the main villain, the reason there's no big fight at the end, and Roddy just beats the shit out of him. Mm-hmm. I shouldn't say that on the radio. Beats the hell out of him. Oh, go um, ahead. Don't it, worry. Don't worry about it. Okay. Yeah. Uh, the reason that happens is because he separated his shoulder to filming. <laughs> who, 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 who separated his shoulder? Ashton Amherst. Oh, he separated okay. Separated his shoulder during filming because oh, okay. he also was operating as a stuntman, as a zombie, made up. And even though he plays the villain, we had, they had decided he could be used as a stuntman for some small stuff. So he had this fall that he was supposed to do, and when he did it. It was a controlled fall. He hit the crash pad, and he panicked and turned on his shoulder, and the crash pad was being held by nine people because there was no way to attach it in the prison. But was, so we had people holding it. It popped out okay. because of the way he turned. And, and it was just, um, you know, and the insurance said we did everything right. Stuff happened. And so he had uh, a separated shoulder, so he couldn't lift his one arm which affected what we had planned for the final sequence. So they, they do a thing on one of the YouTube things where they make fun of it and say, have you ever had a film where you wanted to see the hero beat the hell out of the guy at the end? This is your film. <laughs> you know, the villain just gets the hell beat out of him. And that's, you know, so there was, a, 
unfortunately, that changed the ending of the film. Um, you know, there was lots of we had to constantly keep changing things during filming because of time money issues, which you know happens. But it was it was a a learning experience for me, and where I've learned, you know, there's even more that you have to consider, especially with stunts. Um, you know, so it was fun, and and we have Sylvester Turkai come in as a uh, a zombie also, and and that when when he fights Kurt Angle, that's because they both wrestled against each other in high school, mm-hmm. which I don't think a lot of people. If Sylvester never only lost one match in his high school wrestling career, and that was to Kurt Angle. Wow. And we thought it was kind of cool for Sylvester to be the the zombie that takes him on. Okay. You know, and and that whole line of Pittsburghers know how to kill the undead was another soft to George Romero, who so eventually <laughs> became a Canadian. Um, you know, we we were, I, I was still a little upset when he passed away that they didn't do a memorial in Pittsburgh. Also, like yeah. I was like, you're not you're doing one in Canada. You should do one here. You know, you, you made your first stuff here. Um, so, I mean, there, there's so many people I, I would have loved to have gotten like a Lori Cardale into this or something, mm-hmm. uh, cause Lori's really cool. That would have been a soft to the, the George Romero guys. Yeah. So, but we'll hopefully we'll make another one sometime. I mean, it, you know, maybe them fighting vampires or werewolves or I'd really love to make another film with wrestlers yeah, it, it, and, and be able to do more of what I wanted to do. Like, we had all kinds of really neat stuff that got cut. I could tell you a couple of wrestlers you might want to work with is Edge and Christian. Okay. I know Shane's told me a lot of good things about Christian. I love it when he's on TV. Um, you know, and, and uh, one of those guys, I cannot remember who it was, one of them we talked to at the last minute and then didn't. What We were literally hunting for a wrestler at one point. And flew some people in. Okay. And it was like, oh, we can get this person. Oh, we can get this person for a day. Okay, get them in here. Uh, there was a lot of that going on. And so it, Edge and Christian McGregor, my son was a huge fan of Edge. I like Edge. Um, yeah, he, he's really neat. I mean, there was there was a sequence that didn't make the film where a random female is being attacked by zombies. Mm-hmm. And when she beats up the zombie... She does the "You don't see me" making fun of Cena. <laughs> yeah, I think a lot of people would love to see Cena eaten by a horde of zombies. I'll I be frank with you. I'll be yeah. frank with you. I'm a big Cena fan, and I'll tell you why. <laughs> For all the people that don't like him, I'm going to say this: He did something that was equivalent to Hulk Hogan body slamming Andre the Giant when he had yes. Edge and the Big Show up over his shoulder. And he did the attitude adjustment on both of them. Cena, I think, is uh, for me. He doesn't have to prove himself. Uh, he's he's. Uh, well, he, he, he sells tickets. It, it, he, I just wish. I think he gets blamed for the PG turn of WWE. Yeah. And and I think that in a world that just elected Donald Trump. Yep. That there's an audience for what ECW and wrestling used to be. Yep. That isn't just what, I mean, I think people have, everything become so sanitized and boring. Yep. That, uh, and, and we have to be, can't offend this person, can't offend this, can't do this, that at a certain point people go, they rebel. And they go, you know what, I need to just have, I, mean, well, I used to be a therapist, and we would, and, and I would work with people on the street, and they'd say, you know, that that, the, line that comes out of African Americans is, you know, keeping it real. Yeah. We're not keeping anything real anymore. Mm-hmm. Everything is fake. And it's like everybody took Del Carnegie classes and decided to talk so dull. That's why Roddy was so cool because he wasn't fake. Mm-hmm. You know, he you know, he put me in Piper's Pit and the, the, one of the proudest things in my life is being in Piper's Pit and beat the living crap out of me. <laughs> and I was so angry, and I was furious, and I wanted to get up and challenge him to fight. And I said, and then it hit me, and I said, you know what? I'm an effing Piper's Pit. Who the hell, how many people get to do this? How many people get to sit in Piper's Pit 
you know what? I am going to relax and smile. No matter what he says to me, it doesn't matter because I made it to Piper's Pit. Yep. And once I did that, he picked up on it immediately. That's how sharp Roddy was. He saw immediately there wasn't going to be any more getting me upset. I wasn't going to get angry because he wanted me to get mad. You know, from a publicity standpoint, he was right. He would have made us a ton of publicity. If I got up there and challenged a fight or swung at him or done something because I was mad, now we got great publicity. We got heat. Mm -hmm. Okay? Yeah. But I didn't want to do that. Because to me, I, I worked in politics before. I look long term. And I try to go, you know what, what's the long term decision? In this? And I want to make films. And you can't be getting angry. It might work to get us publicity. And that's short term thinking. So, anyways, the moment he saw that, he went right off of that and he wanted to entertain the audience and he went and told Rick Flair stories and had him laughing. And that was. You know, and afterwards he gets in the car and says, hey, Cody, the movie was comedy, wasn't it? And I went, yeah. <laughs> you tricked us. You, we thought we were doing this really serious drama. I said, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I don't know how they read the script and didn't think it was comedy. Uh, but yeah. They thought they were, they were going to do, like, Walking Dead. Like, WWE meets Walking Dead. <laughs> and it, it, it's, it's bizarre in hindsight. Um, but Roddy never realized it was comedy. Once he realized it was a comedy, he said, okay, I thought this sucked. I thought we did a bad job, but now it's funny. This was fun. <laughs> and I asked him, I got in the car and I said, was that real with the coconut? Or was that kayfabe? Was that planned? And he said, was it real when, you, when I had you in Piper's Pit? Were you angry at me? And I said, yes. He said, there's your answer. Uh, wow! Because I wanted, I wanted the hitting. I wanted the hitting, because he wasn't planning to be in New York. We took him there, saying we drove up in the car. Um, I was sick at my stomach, which he knew, and I had. Here, here's how funny it was. I was sick. I was beside myself physically, and I threw up in the car. And I didn't have a change of pants. I threw up on myself and had to clean up, throw up. <laughs> so I um, cleaned up all the stuff. Roddy was nothing but kind. Okay? Mm -hmm. Nothing but kind. Realized that I was really ill. We get up on that stage, and he tells everybody how I threw up on myself. <laughs> <laughs> he tells me how I did a shitty job as director. He just, he will not quit pushing my buttons. Okay? Yeah. Looking at everything, like beating the crap out of me. And I'm sitting there going, I want to swing at this guy. <laughs> and, and, and then I realized what he was doing. This is what he did so well. And so, you know, I, 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 we had, a, we, we had a big argument during film one time. And okay. was, Shane was sick and he was trying to protect him. And I was trying to get water to him and there was all a bunch of stupid macho shit. And we got nose to nose and arguing. And, he said, we're going to film that. I said, we're going to film when I say we're going to film. And it just went back and forth. So then everybody's like, wow, all this heat. We walk off. He says, walk with me. We walk off to the side. And he goes, now everybody's going to respect you. <laughs> <laughs> and Hacksaw comes up to me and goes, you know, Roddy never thought you'd stand up to him. And I said, I told him. I used to be a reporter. I risked my life. I dealt with a district attorney that it was that – was implicated in a, in a double homicide. He, he died, so I, I will never say someone's convicted of anything they, that they did something they weren't convicted of. Um, I don't think he was a very, he was facing a lot of issues, uh, but I actually liked the person even though, but it was a dangerous situation. We had, you know, people dead, people that were accused of murder, all kinds of stuff that I was investigating. Mm -hmm. And I told him, I said, I'm not a wallflower. I might be a very nice man when dealing with you, but if you put me in a corner, I will fight. And I won't know how to fight except to win. And he didn't see that till then. And I said, I told you this, Rod. You know, it's, I don't need to be physically strong. You might beat the crap out of me, but I'm going to stand there and I'm going to swing at you. If you swing at me, I'll swing at you. Um, 
and it was just it was but he so I never knew how much that affect how what he thought of it until Axel told me like six months later at Russell I said Rod I never thought you'd stand up to him and they never say that they'll respect that now you respect you but when he said then I will respect you I knew that he respected mm -hmm. and that's why it came as a shock when he put me in Piper's pit beats crap out of me um, but you know those mistakes made I deserve part of it you know it, it's it's uh it was that you learn from mistakes. And so that's, you know, I try to apply that to each new project. Um, you know, I, I could make that film a hundred times better. I think it's fun. I, I find it odd that Americans don't like it as much as Canadians and the English and the Irish. They, they really liked it in England. It did well. Um, so, you know, humor is an odd thing. You never know who's going to like it. It's interesting you say like that. It. It's interesting you mm -hmm. say that. It's interesting you say that because um, last year I went to a movie nine times, and the movie was Everybody Wants Some by Richard Linkletter. I went to that nine times. I, I loved it. And there were people that looked at me like I had two heads because I saw that nine times. And I'm looking at them thinking, if I had have gone to the latest blockbuster nine times, they would not have bad an eye. People want stuff that's familiar they they keep blocking out creativity. Now you go back to uh, wrestling and how today it's all so conservative or whatever, and everything's so tame. I was watching the um, match between Eddie Guerrero and John Bradshaw Lacefield the other night, where they both got busted open. There was blood all over the ring and whatnot. I wish I could see more of that in wrestling. Absolutely. Now. Yep. I went to, I had given up on wrestling, and after we did the film, I went to an event for, or right before we did the film, I went to an event for East, the East, uh, for Extreme Rising. Mm -hmm. And I went in there and saw New Jack, I saw all these guys, I saw Matt Hardy was there, and I went, my God, this is what I want to watch. This is what I can't take my eyes off of. And it's not guys doing every move. It looks like they're fighting. I mean, people always say wrestling's fake. Well, here's my answer to that. Everybody in the United States watched Friends. Yeah. And everybody thought that Jennifer Aniston wanted to be with David Schwimmer. <laughs> I mean, that shows fake. It's, it's scripted. Mm -hmm. You know, we watch it. We become emotionally involved. It's acting. Okay. Well, we watch acting all the time. You know, it's just... Jennifer Anderson, if you look at who she dated, doesn't date guys like David Schwimmer. Nope. You know? But it emotionally tugs at us. You know, I I don't watch a lot of professional sports anymore because other than baseball, and my reasoning is because I go, you know, something's wrong when Katrina hits New Orleans and New Orleans goes to the Super Bowl. When the Boston bombing happens and now Boston's in, in the NHL championship. When... Uh, you know, all of a sudden it's brother versus brother, the Harbaugh brothers, or it's, you know, or September 11th happens and New, New England Patriots are in the Super Bowl. Yeah. Something seems, what I saw in wrestling, I'm watching the same thing. You're giving me what, you know, it's Peyton Manning's last year and he makes it and wins the Super Bowl. Yeah. It's Jerome Bettis' last year, I'm a Pittsburgh Steeler fan, and he wins the Super Bowl. Are you kidding me? Ray Lewis is last year and he wins the Super Bowl. That sounds contrived to me. Yep. And it doesn't happen in baseball because of the Black Sox scandal. And, and uh, you know, but I have gotten where the NFL, something isn't right. I don't care what they say. They can sue me. Doug, fine. I don't have any money. Um, they are, I, I just, I've gotten where professional sports doesn't move me. And, you know, and also the athletes are boring. Everybody's saying the same thing so they can get their celebrity endorsements. Oh, my goodness. I miss Deion Sanders. I miss people that made me hate them. Yep. You know, well, other that, Tom Brady. That, that's, Tom what, Brady. that's what made you – know, I, I, I was going to say, that's what made promos between Dusty Rhodes and Ric Flair so good. Yep. They had you invested yep. before the match. And, and that stuff excites me and – um, you know, Roddy tried to explain to some of the young guys how to enter a ring and how they need to go slower. 
mm-hmm. to build up the audience, to work the crowd. Uh, he was a master at it. I've worked with a lot of politicians. I used to work in politics. Mm-hmm. And I think some of them could have learned from these techniques. Uh, he, Donald Trump knows how to do it. Um, but he was around wrestling, too. And Roddy knew how to do that. And, um, you know, it, it's – I don't see that. I watch a lot of these guys, and I go, I'm not excited that here they come. I, and and the, the fight sequences don't look real. Um, you know, just like acting. I mean, like I said, I use friends analogy. You know, if Jennifer Aniston doesn't make us believe that she's Rachel, it doesn't work. So when wrestlers go out there and perform moves that are obviously fake, because of course we know wrestling's fake, it doesn't sell me as an audience. It's interesting. You know, you... I'm, I'm watching entertainment. Uh, I tried to watch mixed martial arts. It bores me. I don't yeah. like watching two guys slowly grapple till they can break a wrist. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, I'm just like, okay, there isn't enough going on here. And most of the guys don't have personality and character. They were trying to sell uh, Rousey there, and then she went out and lost. Um, and, and bang, she's gone. She's now useless. Uh, Do you think she's going to wrestle Stephanie at WrestleMania? Maybe. You know, I mean, the problem was they missed the moment. Yeah. The moment was when she was on top of the world. Well, Stephanie, you know, Stephanie's never uh, done a WrestleMania. They need to get Stephanie in the ring before she gets to the point where she can't. Well, you never know how old she can be because that. Uh, what was her name? The old lady that, were, that was in. They brought in there in the eighties and nineties. Oh, the fabulous um, Mula. Yeah, I can't remember. I don't remember her name, but I remember they had the one lady had been around for years. I mean, they, they, they. There's an audience out there for what they're doing. But, you know, you could, it used to be great social commentary. Mm-hmm. And if you do it right, if I believe differently than you, um, you know, you could have a character go out and really make the argument that a Cory Booker makes or someone makes for Black Lives Matter mm-hmm. um, and have him face off with a cop who believes that he's perfectly okay, probably using too much violence. Okay. Where both sides are legitimately. I need to do this to protect people. No, you're overstepping your bounds and you're not respecting the law. Both sides have a legitimate argument and let real heat develop and watch the audience go crazy. Um, I don't know why that isn't being done except everybody's afraid. Oh, we might offend somebody. Yep. But that's what, you know, if, if it's not wrestling works best when what it's showing is what's going on in our lives. Why did Iron Sheep work? Because we were angry at the lack of military proudness from the nation that won World War II couldn't deal with Iran. They were holding our people hostage, and we felt powerless. And Vince smartly played off of that. Yep. And Iron Sheik only works if these things he is saying are legitimately what someone from Iran would have said. Yep. It can't be the carbon copy, over-the-top, goofy characterization of it. It's got to be real. You know, like we, 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 you know, I, I watch Fox News and they refer to different groups as savages or whatever. That's ludicrous. To them, they're supporting their side. We have our side. I view them, we don't view their tactics as correct. Okay. Mm-hmm. We go, well, they, they, they kill people, they kill innocents. Well, what do we do when we bomb people? You know, now, to me, because I work in politics, it's very simple. We both have interests. Those interests have collided, and we've decided to settle it by force of arms. Okay. I'm not morally correct. You're not morally correct. Neither one of us is morally right. They're not evil. We're not evil. They view us as evil. Okay. That doesn't mean I think that we have no right to do it either. You know what I mean? Because that's where a lot of people go. Well, we're both morally equivalent, so we aren't right. No. But wrestling takes that and brings it to the forefront when it's done right. But right now, we just have a bunch of Manila people yep. who, you know, we can only hate because they're – because what happens is if they don't stand for something, and I'm a villain, right? Mm-hmm. How can I be a villain? Why am I a villain? Because I'm a bad guy. Well, and I act in a bad fashion. What made Roddy Piper work was Roddy Piper believed he was the good guy. And then people started to believe him. Archie Bunker, Yep. to use a TV analogy – you know, Norman Lear wrote him to be the awful guy and to be meathead to be the good guy. 
But what actually happened was the American public said, I like Archie Bunker. Yep. I agree with him. And, and, and of a lot of things he's saying, because Mormon Lear wrote it well, where you could identify with him because he wasn't uh, just a bad guy. He was a guy who this is how he saw the world. And he might be wrong, but that doesn't make him evil. Um, and, you know, that's what made the attitude here. Everybody was great. It's because it really worked. And it's people a, ate it up. It's interesting you bring this up because at Christmas time, my. They had um, SmackDown on. Um, um, this, I think, was Christmas Eve. They had SmackDown on, and my brother and I could barely make it through half hour of it. And I said to my brother, I said, let's go in the computer room, go on YouTube, and look at some real wrestling. And we're watching, like, Steamboat Flair and Steamboat uh, Savage and, uh, and uh, Jake the Snake Roberts and... Uh, and uh, people like that. We, we even watched Outback Jack. Uh, you know, I preferred to watch him over Roman Reigns, you know. Yeah, and I feel bad for it. Roman Reigns should be a star. He should be, yep, Everything I agree. Everything about him says screams superstar. He's, he's a smart guy. He has the look. He has the size. He has the ability to deliver. But if you give him crappy lines and crappy storylines, that don't move anybody. I mean, all we're. It's a male soap opera. It's social commentary, and Vince has decided to make it. You know, when you write something for seven-year-olds, yeah, seven-year-olds will get bored. That, yeah, that's what actually happens, and you can't expect an adult to want to watch that. And and uh, you know, I know that everybody wants to make everything safe for. I have a I have a fifteen-month-old baby. You know what? My goal as an adult, as a father, is to raise him to be an adult because he will live, if he lives 75 years, he will live 57 of them as an adult. He will live 18 or 17 as a child. Okay, why do I want the world to be about the first 17 years and not the last 57? Um, you know, we have a world where real things happen. People are fighting wars. People get beheaded in ISIS. Yeah. You know, we have, we have economic inequality. We have people riding in the streets. We have real things happening. And wrestling has decided that it, it's a comic book world. Yeah. With, you know, John Cena. And I'm not picking on Cena because I do think what you said is correct, but I think he gets blamed for it. But you have them doing the, the, the cartoon stuff with Hasbro where they're running around and you have a regular day job. And like, okay, what is, what's the point of this? You know, I mean, and, and you compare it to Marvel. <laughs> which is really successful and all wrestlers are are real life superheroes yep. good guys and bad guys yeah but but it has to relate to uh bigger themes and you know that that that's what's so you know you could have we have people in the streets and we can be playing off of those things and, 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 again, presenting them fairly. You know, I, I, I worked in politics, so I believe in every, none of these people are evil. They're all representing interests. Um, and, and when you start to view one side or the other as evil, you quit talking. And, and, and that doesn't work. Uh, and, and um, you know, they, they, they feel, everyone wants to feel like they're changing the world. So fine, have social justice warrior guy. You know, I mean, you do a lot of really cool stuff off of playing off of these these themes. I mean, Steve Bannon could probably run WWE better right now. He can write their storylines. I'd like to see Jim Cornette do it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, it's um, so so. I know my wife is going to be coming home soon. I should, but I uh, so she might walk through this door. <laughs> I know you're going to edit this down, so. Yeah. Um, the, you know, it, it, talking about the universal themes, I actually have three wrestlers. One is an unknown indie wrestler that's mm -hmm. going to be in Kexford. Um And we're playing off themes of the men in black are keeping the aliens out. And all the men in black are going to be white pretty boys. Okay. Who, who believe they're doing the right thing. You know, because they do. 
Mm-hmm. You know, there's, we have this argument about immigration. Well, there's people that believe they're doing the right thing by keeping people up. There's other people that believe we're doing the wrong thing. Neither side is evil. Um, but when they label them as such, you know, and so we're playing off of those things. You know, we're hoping that Kirk plays a Secret Service agent. We'll see because um, he's with WWE now. Uh, Shane has signed up to be the fire chief of mm-hmm. Kecksburg. And we have a guy by the name of, I think he, his name's Scott Joshua, and I think he wrestles under something. His last name, is his character is Reigns, but he wrestles down in Virginia. That is playing the African-American in the script. Um, and, and, and a really cool guy. He came to an open call, drove up from Virginia, and, and nailed it. And we were going to go with someone else, and we said, no, he's just too good. This guy really wants to do this because this whole theme of he's married to a white woman and then his characters and the story is in love with a white woman he can't have because it's the 1960s. Um, so there's a lot of this playing off of black people being invisible in mm-hmm. society at that point. Um, you know, that, that matters to me because of having seen people wrongly accused, convicted, sit in jail for a decade. On, on on murder charges or other, you know, and, and it, it, I can't help but go, there's a reason why we consider that the greatest injustice. Um, and when we get these hysterias, black people pay the price more than white people. Um, and again, I think wrestling could do that. I think wrestling could use that and, and, and say something that matters at the same time making money yep. and making me want to watch it. You know, I want to watch wrestling. Now I only watch WrestleMania. I wait for one time a year. I watch WrestleMania. I didn't even watch that. I mean, Undertaker. I didn't this year. Yeah. (laughs) Undertaker, you know, I understand him losing to Brock, but now it's like his record's now 23-2. and And I'm like, really? Now his record looks like shit. Yeah. I, you know, I, I was, the last guy I really got excited about was CM Punk. Yeah, they screwed him. I love Punk because Punk understood how to make. I was at the WrestleMania in in New York, Mm -hmm. and when he came out to go against uh, in New Jersey against uh, Undertaker, I so wanted him to win because I cared. He made me like him, and again, he was an anti-hero, a lot like Roddy. To me, he was a lot like Roddy Piper, and I thought he was an under use talent. I thought the move MMA was was silly um, because what makes Punk work is not whether he can fight or not. It was him as a character. You know, and MMA needed him because they were trying to, they need characters because they're dull on the, on the character side. They have guys who just swing at each other. Okay. Um, you know, and all these sports are in trouble because of the, the head injuries and all that. Um, you know, that's but what are we going to do? Have a whole world where no one has any contact sports? People are going to find it. They're going to do it. Um, you know, it's because we choose to. As no, the, men, it's what Fight Club revolves around. Yeah. You think of Fight Club. That's that's the world of wrestling real. And, and what's that all about? A world so sanitized that men cannot be men. Yeah. Men are, you know... Uh, and, and, and historically, cultures that do that, whether it was Troy, when they said that they're, they're, the king makes a statement that all of my men have become dancing men. All, all, um, people don't read and realize what that's actually talking about, but they no longer can protect the country. And, and the culture collapses. So there you go. I'm a philosopher. <laughs> I was going to say, that. too. I'm talking about wrestling and zombies and... <laughs> Another thing too, I, I, I and that turned me against wrestling. I hated what they did to Sting. Like I'm, it's like I'm sorry, but Triple H is not the wrestler Sting is, and he should have taken the loss at that WrestleMania. There were several people in the theater that night were kind of pissed off, and then they had this three-on-one elimination match where they had Chris Jericho beat. Roddy Piper, Ricky Steamboat, and Jimmy Snuka, and then he beats up Ric Flair, only to get punched out by Mickey Rorick. And I thought, 
I'm sorry, there's something about that I don't accept. And the, and it's like, you know, like Vince has got his head up his ass. Yeah. I, I, it, 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 it. And, and that's what can't, I can't watch it because it's got to feel real. And I agree. Make me... and, and I agree with the honky tonk man on when it comes to uh, Shawn Michaels. You lost your smile. Well, maybe Vince wasn't bent in the right position. <laughs> Yeah, we we thought about using Honky Tonk Man too, but um, when I read when I wrote another script dealing with this, the one that was going to use Roddy and his son, we had it set in Vegas and had Honky Tonk Man flying as a vampire, <laughs> okay. um, playing Viva Las Vegas. Yeah, because we thought that would be funny, a Honky Tonk Vampire <laughs> flying around Vegas. There you go. That's, you know, you know, it's, it's got to make you got to make you laugh. Yep. But um, well, she's going to be pulling up, so I should. Uh, do you have any other questions? And actually, I, I wanted to touch base on um, um, one of your your recent films here for a minute. But before I do, okay. I wanted to ask you about the makeup job done on your zombies. You know, because we never did t- talk about that. Oh, okay. Um, you know, we had very little money for makeup. Mm-hmm. And so the, the, they had some wonderful people, Z Vigoda uh, from down in Parkersburg, that went ahead and did the makeup. And most of the people came in their own makeup because we were in a position of that was the way we could afford it. Now, Kurt Angle and some of the other ones, the makeup was done. And the, the zombie that gets split in half, that was all part of the production. But a lot of those random zombies... Yeah. That were not wrestlers, were people who came, uh, they, they, they showed up, there was like 500 of them, and I went through and said, pull these people, they have the best makeup job, and that's how that happened, and I just chose to bring them to the front. <laughs> I was going to bring up, um, oh, okay. Okay, I was so going to... I wish we had more money for makeup, but we did, we, I think we had like $500, I can't remember, it wasn't very much. <laughs> okay. I was going to say, you get a film, I think, in post-production, and you're working with an actress I have interviewed on here, Lisa Wilcox. Is she in there? <laughs> uh, yeah, we, 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 uh, you know, um, we had a producer that knows her, and um, we're going to be doing Kexburg, yep. and we're excited about the, the prospect of working with her. I mean, it's a cameo role. Um, but she was in Nightmare on Elm Street 4 and 5. Yeah. And uh, I haven't even gotten to speak to her. I mean, this person knew her, took care of it. And actually, this one producer said oh, um, that they're going to pay the contract. I mean, they're going to pay her to be in the film. I said, okay. You know, if they're paying, that's great. I, cause we love the idea of her being in the film. Mm-hmm. Um, but it was a very small role, and it originally wasn't built to be a cameo. And then we had to bump it up. Because you take advantage of it, you have a chance to have somebody of a certain caliber involved. And, I've, I, you know, I, I've got to work with a few horror icons before, like Doug Bradley from Pinhead. Oh, Love that's Doug. right. Uh, what was the film you used him as a voice, did you not? Yes, uh, Lucifer's Unholy Desire. Okay, um, yeah. He, he lives here in Pittsburgh, so yeah. he is uh, very accessible. And in a perfect world, I would love for him to be part of uh, Kecksburg. You know, we, we have a role that would be perfect for him, and we haven't cast it yet. We have one major role left, or two, because we have that and um, the the president, which we've made an offer to someone, which I can't disclose who it is, but it's a, it's a pretty cool actor, and I would love to work with him, and I'm waiting, because he's like half the budget of the, the film, of the, of the actors, it's just for this one guy to play Lyndon Johnson. Um, so we have to wait. And see, but then Doug, the, the role we would love to have Doug in is a one-day role, but, you know, you don't, we haven't made any formal offers, and I just wait and see what happens, you know, because I haven't got to the point of that role needs cast. Most of the film's cast, but that, I'm leaving that role open. And you, also, and you also did a film called um, uh, Breeding Firm, is that, what, is that what it's called? Oh, yeah. I rarely talk about that film. I hate that film. Oh, okay. Um, I, I gave up all rights on it. I made a film with Richard John Walters, which appears in Pro Wrestlers vs. Zombies. He was in My Bloody Valentine 3D. Okay. Like Harry Wood in that. Um, I love Richard. Um, that that film, 
it was my first film I got distribution. Uh, but that's that's about all I'll say about it. <laughs> we made it for fifty four hundred dollars or something. Uh, it's uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Well, pro, pro wrestlers versus zombies is that on Blu-ray? I I think it is. Uh, Troma did the uh, all that with the Blu-ray. Okay. They have a DVD version which has Roddy and them on the commentary that is sold directly from. We were allowed to sell our own version of the film. Okay. And then Troma has their version of the film which has the director's commentary. Okay. And. Uh, which is slightly off, not on our part, but we lined it up with the film and they didn't line it up right. So the director's commentary, I'm telling you what's going to happen in the scene about three seconds before it happens, when it was actually designed to be right when the action's happening. Because unlike a lot of commentaries where people sit there and they drink and they just ramble, Mm -hmm. we decided to actually discuss the film. Yeah, I agree. This is what we did here. This is what we did here. This is why we did it. Um, so it would have been a really cool commentary if it was lined up correct. Uh, you know, Roddy's and them was lots of fun. Yeah. You know, uh, Shane did most of the talking to see sort of took the lead. And then, you know, there's great stuff. Like when Matt's cut in half, Rebby says, I don't need that half. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what? Yeah, so the- What's that? Oh, go ahead. I was going to say, you know, it was fantastic having you come on here tonight and talk about this. I, I never heard of the film until, uh, like I said, I had uh, Colt and I had Ariel, uh, Piper's son and daughter, on here. And I was just looking up stuff on his films to, you know, to to ask them about that and not just wrestling alone, you know. And uh, I was like, that just stood out to me. And so I brought that up. And, and uh, they were quite... We huh? It's a, real, it's a real testament to Roddy how great of kids he raised yep. um, and, and, and what he went through to do it. Because I, he told us how he was hit by cars and people had stabbed him and just horrific things were done to him. Oh, Terry Funk um, went through that too. Yes. Yep. Yes. And, 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 and uh, you know, I, I just... Yeah, some people just uh, take stuff way too seriously, you know. And then there's some people that uh, kind of have a right to have people like, like I said, Shawn Michaels, I have no use for because I thought the Canadian flag thing was uncalled for. There was no call for that, you know. You know, I, I we only had a taste of it, you know, when uh, of how crazy things can get for you. And I worked in politics, so I was used to crazy people, but... I remember um, walking when we were doing the showings of pro wrestlers. We had a guy who was really in everything. He was buying everything, and he was following me to the point he was following me when I went in to, to take a piss. Okay. And I had to tell people keep that guy away from me. He's making me nervous. And you know, I Shane said there was a lot of different things. He said, "Welcome." So what we go through being a celebrity, and and I and I don't think the public realizes, you know, that that uh, there's always someone trying to make something out of something or or use you to to further their emotional needs, um, and it makes these guys very wary. Uh, I'm very fortunate that I get to work with them, and you gain their trust, and you have to be cognizant of that. Yep. You have to be uh, worthy of it. And I've made mistakes and, and, and you know, um, and, and things that I wish I'd handle things a different way. Um, but that's the only way you learn and grow. And, and um, so I believe in forgiveness. Um, but, you know, I feel they go through a lot and it's not all roses, especially wrestlers, because they beat up their body for it. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, do we, do, you know, we're, we're hoping to have some really cool people. Uh, my friend Maria Olson is going to be in Kecksburg in a cameo, and she was in Percy Jackson and Val and a bunch of uh, really great horror. She's been in a hundred some horror films. We have a bunch of, I would say, the workhorses of indie horror, and you know they they they, they might never have done a thing that 
you know, you absolutely knew. Like, Maria was in Paranormal Activity 3 or 4. I can't remember which one. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, there are things that, you know, she was in I Spit on Your Grave. Um, but these are uh, the yeoman workers, but we get enough of them, and we can make an amazing film. I mean, this is, a, you know, the second largest UFO incident in North American history, and it's never been made into a film. All the other major incidents have been made into a film. And... Uh, we have people coming from everywhere to volunteer time and their effort. And, um, you know, we're going to be doing an Indiegogo in October to uh, give people really cool stuff like spaceships and aliens that they can purchase. Um, And and we need them to pre-buy because that way we can control the film creatively and do it the right way rather than having to have someone go out there and, and change everything. Um, and people are realize that many times you have a good idea, you can get someone to fund it. Uh, yeah. But you want to be able to do it the way you see it, it will work for the public, and that's what we need people to invest. I mean, it's a huge story. I mean, Hillary Clinton demanded the records um, in 2016 on Kexpert. She did a freedom of information request, and the government said they don't exist. So the thing fell from the sky. You re- the Army responded. The Air Force was there. And the records don't exist. Okay. And if they, you know, w- one of our taglines is that they could lie. What's so secret that Hillary Clinton can't know? Yeah. What What is such a secret that she can't know? Um, and so it's really weird that our advertising is revolving around Hillary Clinton. Yeah. Kind of a kind of an odd thing. I, I mean, I ran as a Trump delegate of all things, but I also call him an asshole on national television, which is. <laughs> did you ever so think? My, go ahead. I, I was going to say, did you? Um, it's sad that we don't have Roddy Piper anymore. But did you ever think about uh, using Colt or Ariel in one of your movies? I well, I I've thought about it because I would love. Uh, Colt has hung out with my friend with Shane and a friend of mutual friend of ours, a guy named Bill Townsend, was trying to get classic wrestling revolution up and running. And they were going to use Roddy, and uh, Bill was an internet tycoon. Um, and he's actually appears in one of my films, Gore Orphanage, that I produced. Uh, he acted in it. And so he is, you know, he was there at the funeral and um, has gotten to know Colt and um, the whole family. And so I would love to, love to, because they're, they're you know, Roddy Piper... When I was a kid, I sat there and watched him on TV and was fascinated with him. Yep. Absolutely fascinated. I mean, somebody should make a biopsy of him, and the perfect actor is Russell Crowe. If you look at Russell Crowe in, in how he looks physically in the face and Jeez. the way he behaves, it's so similar. I agree. I agree. Yeah, I never thought about that. If you see him walking away, I just watched the film was like set in the 70s, and Crow is walking away, and I could have swore it was Roddy Piper. The way he walks, the hair, um, and it, that would be an amazing film. Wow. Do you ever think about any like any indie actors like ever think about using somebody like say uh, <laughs> throwing this one out here, but he's a catch, the Tommy Wiseau. Oh. <laughs> Or one of the trailer yeah. park boys. You know, it, 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 it's interesting because well, with Kexpert, our goal is this, the highest quality we can do. Um, and I don't mean to say that they're not quality, but they, you do some things, like when we did pro wrestlers, you do them to get attention. Mm-hmm. You cast this person, you do this and this and this. And then to me, there's two levels of, and then you go, okay, this, here's what we're doing. It's a very serious film. It's a very, you know, a, a certain different tone. Um, and it requires the best actors you get your hands on um, for the price. And then you have films where you're doing it because, it, like, well, we should have done it for us. We should have took Gallagher up on the thing and had him smashing zombie hits mm-hmm. um, because that would have been fun. Yeah. And the whole purpose is fun. So it, it's, it's always, you know, Tommy would be a great guy in a film like that. I wouldn't want to put him in a position where he's required to – seriously become the person because I don't know I don't know if he can or cannot <laughs> I only know if he can watch in the room okay I think he can be Tommy 
thing you would call it was no. I've watched the room. I've been there and through the, the, the plastic forks and spoons. Um, you know, I've yelled bridge when the bridge appears. My wife doesn't understand this. She won't go to see it. And I said, you have to. You just have to go and experience it. You don't want to watch it. Watching it at home doesn't mean anything. Being there matters. Yeah. Um, you know, so, you know, and, and, and trauma, and we were very fortunate to have trauma for, uh be the distributor, and I, I always thought they would be the right person. I grew up watching their films, um, and and Lloyd Kaufman is he gives starting out filmmakers a chance, and and I'm starting late in life because I spent most of it in politics, um, but things have been going r- really well. I mean, I'm able to do this full time, and I have a wife who works very hard to enable me to do that. And, and it's not like, hey, I'm making money or a lot of money. You know, she sacrifices um, so that we can do this um, because she's really into the arts, too. And, and I, she's a blessing. Well, you so, know you know what, Cody? I, I've got to say, if you got any projects in the future coming up, you know, don't hesitate to reach out. Uh, I'd be more than happy to have you come back on here and promote uh anything you got going on um this this project definitely caught my attention and uh i share your love for wrestling and uh and like yourself i like the old school stuff so much better than what's going on today and this was a tribute to that so you know it was supposed to be fun and it's lots of inside jokes Mm -hmm. um you know it's constantly uh but it's been the english and the in canada and ireland and stuff they got it better than the american so yeah, I, I think they. My wife says when they saw that you had all these Hall of Famers and how did you get them together, they thought they were going to see something with, you know, a ten million dollar budget. And we, you have limitations of time, money, and, and it's mainly the money. You know, the money determines how much time you have to film. Mm-hmm. Um, and and you have to make compromises. And and you know people don't realize that, and you end up with a seven person crew doing all the work instead of like a thirty person crew. So, you know, it's, could, could I do it better today? Yes. But that's because I went through the process and learned. Um, you know, so, you know, it was, I never quit going on it and I had to raise the $300,000 and um, find people that were willing to invest in it. And that's, you know, that's the biggest headache of all. That's where we're at with Kexburg right now. So, yeah. Well, well, my the, my older son is having trouble with the younger son who's 15 <laughs> months. Then he's looking at me. He's going to bed now. It's past bedtime. Well, be, before you go, before you yeah. go, could you do a, a plug for my show? Absolutely. Yeah, just state your name and say you're listening to Greg Gilbert on Python's Paradise out in New Brunswick, Canada. You got okay. that? Greg Gilbert. Yep. Greg Gilbert. On Python's Paradise. Python's Paradise. Out in New Brunswick, Canada. You ever been up this way? I have never been up that way. I, the furthest I've went is to Toronto. I had the pleasure. I saw Owen Hart live uh, when he was in Fredericton perform, and I'm, I'm so sad he's gone and the way he went, but I remember seeing him in the ring. Yeah, that was... Oh, Shane told me a lot of stories about that. Yeah. Um, this is Cody Knotts, and you are listening to Greg Gilbert on Python's Paradise in New Brunswick, Canada. And we are celebrating pro wrestlers versus zombies. <laughs> it has big, powerful men and really hot babes smashing zombies.